Thank you, everybody, for attending today's talk. Uh, as you know, this is the, um, I think it's a weekly talk that we do now on the future of diplomacy. And part of the reason that we do this uh, talk on the future of diplomacy was because I was trying to figure out what we were going to do um, in our ministry um, with the onset of COVID. So today we have Kasper Klunja, uh, who is, I believe, Danish. Danish, yes? I, I mix up Northern Europe, so <laughs> forgive me. I'm sure lots of you, people you, do. Just say European. You'll be safe. Yeah, no, Northern European, uh, who was the first tech ambassador for Denmark and uh, is now vice president for Microsoft European Affairs, which basically makes you Microsoft's ambassador to the European Union, uh, if, if uh, I understand that correctly. But in any case, that's, I, I, what, that's, the, that's how I'm going to categorize you. Right? Uh, I think that's pretty role, close to our seat. <laughs> there you are. Uh, is, your role is to strengthen the company's relationship with the EU government's policymakers and institutions. Um, so, uh, if I can just give you like a little idea of why it is that I'm interested in, in this particular subject, and, and I'm really, really pleased that we're, we're able to speak to you, uh, is because even before COVID, technology was very interesting, very important, very exciting. Uh, COVID, on the other hand, has managed to place technology uh, front and center in our lives. So, whether in our private lives or our professional lives, especially under lockdown or quarantine, limits our movements uh, and, and interactions. Uh, so technology has all of a sudden become a real enabler and a liberator uh, from confinement. Uh, it's, uh, it's our hope in terms of a vaccine and a cure. Uh, and it becomes a means also, I think we'll talk about this later hopefully, re of how we're reinventing work and how we're gonna uh, earn a living online depending on how long this uh, pandemic continues. So uh, it also in this sense becomes necessary, uh, a necessary means for us to connect with others and to learn from each other. Um, and whereas once we complained of the power of the uh, technology companies, and I think in 2017, that was exactly the issue that uh, Denmark would have been facing, uh, very powerful technology companies um, pushing into Europe, uh, Europe needing to push back. Uh, now, I think many of us look to those um, to tech innovation and technology companies as, as a lifeline. Uh, to be honest, where would we be uh, if we didn't have Amazon delivering all of our goods and, and services essentially to us? Um, so. Uh, and specifically, I wanted to talk a, a little about, you know, what governments should be doing in this new environment. How should governments look at technology companies? Uh, there, are, there are the massive companies like uh, uh, Microsoft, Amazon, Google, Facebook, and, and so on. And then there are the smaller ones, the minnows who could become extremely, uh, extremely powerful one day. How do we manage to, to, how do we understand technology companies? What are their interests? Um, how do they view governments uh, and, and uh, populations uh, under specific uh, states and under the state system? Uh, so uh, there'll be a lot more questions, um, but I was uh, I was hoping that you could start by telling us about your experience as a tech ambassador and then as a tech ambassador on the other side. Over to you, Casper. Yeah, sorry, I had to I had to unmute here, which was apparently not easy. I'm not allowed to unmute myself, so thanks to your organizing <laughs> organizers for allowing me to say a few words here. Um, listen, th thanks a lot. And not an easy question to answer. So, how many hours do we have for for my yeah. reply on this first question, Omar? <laughs> well, the audience is with us for an hour, but I think we can extend it to four hours <laughs> if necessary. <laughs> no, great. Listen, I, I think first of all, thanks a lot for the invitation. It's um, it, it's always a pleasure. And uh, as, as I said before, we went online. I'm not saying this to be polite, but I've actually you know, spent quite a bit of time in, in the UAE uh, talking to, to the government and others on how we basically prepare for the digital age, which is, I think, goes to the core of your, your question. Yeah. Um, and, and I think also your description of my own journey from, from being in government for from, from many years, uh, being in, in the Danish foreign ministry, mm -hmm. uh, most lately as, as uh, this quite innovative role of being an ambassador to the tech industry <clears throat> and then moving to the other side of the table um, has, has given me certain certain perspectives on, on what it is that we, we need to do. But I think if I boil all of it down, I think the fundamental uh, challenge that we're facing here in, in the 21st century is that, you know, because of the fast pace of these new technologies that are coming up uh, all over the place, uh, the understanding of what's happening on the technology side is perhaps not where it needs to be if we look at it from a government point of view. And similarly, I would say, again, also speaking from the other side of the table now in Microsoft, is that we also have to become much better at understanding, you know, the genuine, the legitimate concerns of governments, but also, you know, 
hit the control L delete button and make sure that the mindset of the of big technology companies, but also the mindset of governments, that 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 happens in a way where we collaborate more freely, where we don't see um, any any prob problematic aspects of actually being in the same room, better understanding uh, what's what's happening on the other side. And if you want me to to be a bit more specific on this, I would say that if you look sort of historically on some of the previous uh, the, industrial revolutions uh, that we've seen over the last a couple of hundreds, hundreds of years, I think there's always been a gap between, you know, where reality uh, was at and then where policies or regulations, uh, uh, where, 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 that, where that was at. And I think, you know, there were certainly a couple of years, if not decades, before policies and regulations caught up with the previous industrial revolutions. I would probably argue, Omar, that because of, of what we're seeing around us, AI, machine learning, you know, uh, cloud computing, et cetera. That gap is certainly not uh, smaller today. I would probably argue that it's becoming bigger and bigger. And, and that's a problem, uh, I think, for governments. You represent a government. I think it's a problem for, for citizens. But I think ultimately it's also a problem for technology companies. I think all of us should be interested in making sure that we have the right set of policies, the right sets of, uh, of, of regulations uh, to be sure that we defend fundamentally some of the key values that we've uh, been working on for a long time. So, so I guess I guess the issue is, um, and, and you might ask that question, is it very different uh, being you know, the VP of Microsoft responsible for European government affairs compared to be the tech ambassador in, in Denmark? And of course there are differences, uh, but fundamentally I think I was trying to be a bridge between government and the tech industry in my previous job. And I would probably argue that it's very much the same that I that I'm uh, the same role that I'm going to play now, being a bridge between uh, you know the, the corporate headquarters of, of a U.S. company and then uh, European governments and and European institutions. Can I ask then? Uh, can you compare? How did you organize your um, work uh, schedule as a tech ambassador uh, for the government, and how do you now organize it? Um, your your daily work uh, as as an ambassador for a a company. Uh, and, and how do you define the interests of the company behind you? Yeah, we, we've been quite honest and I was quite honest in saying it was to some extent a diplomatic experiment we did in Denmark. Uh, we were probably yeah. the first country in the world to establish this role as a tech ambassador. Uh, I think other countries have followed uh, up. Um, I, I just want to shout out to, to my good friend, the, the UAE Minister for Artificial Intelligence. Yeah. Um, he is certainly at a much higher level than, than an ambassador. But I think the idea of looking into the future by having representatives responsible yeah. for technology issues is very much the same approach in UAE as it was in, as it was in Denmark. So we mm -hmm. were sort of building the airplane as we flew along. We didn't have mm -hmm. a playbook we could look into saying you know, that's how you, you have diplomatic relations with, uh, with technology companies around the world. Mm -hmm. um, where, where my job was different uh, compared to other ambassadorial ambassadorial postings was that we had a global mandate. So it was not only about being the ambassador to Silicon Valley or being the ambassador to, you know, the the Chinese company in, in Shenzhen or or elsewhere. It was really to try and have a, a global approach and working with the industry uh, across uh, across the planet. And and why did we do that? Well, we did that because we think fundamentally that technology doesn't necessarily respect sort of the the tr traditional Westphalian uh, structure of, of, yeah. of governments. It, it transcends everything. Uh, it doesn't respect uh, national borders. It doesn't respect mm -hmm. regional organizations. So, so in order to look into the future, inform our decision makers, our uh, uh, politicians, uh, we thought we had to take a sort of a global stab at that. But, but if we speak very practically, Omar, uh, you know, mm -hmm. we, we didn't have a network. Um, when, when I knocked on the doors in, in Silicon Valley and said, you know, hey, I'm the ambassador of Denmark <laughs> to the tech industry, you know, they say, you know, come again. Uh, what are you? Who are you? And what do you want uh, to do with us? And, and very That's often brilliant. they sort of, they looked through the uh, small crack in the door rather than opening the door completely. So it took a while to normalize uh, relations. Yeah. Well, that, that uh, says more about them than about you, of course. Yeah, but but you know you, you could sort of be you could be a little bit vain about it, saying that's super inappropriate because you represent a, a government. But I would actually say that I have sympathy for the fact that when you're trying to break new ground and do yeah. things differently, it takes a little bit of time before sure. uh, before you have a, a standardized set of uh, of uh, modus operandi. Mm -hmm. But I think we got there, and and one of the one of the traits of being a small country, I think yeah. UAE is is is, is uh, differently sized. But you cannot do things alone. You have to multilateralize things. You have to work with other countries, with other stakeholders. 
and that was very much part of our tactics to to make sure that yeah. we, we bandwagoned with others okay and, and but you would do that under the uh, umbrella of the european union presumably we would do it on the overall umbrella of the European Union, but we also, I mean, uh, I think that some of these issues were, were national in their, in their nature. Uh, if yeah. we talk about some of the more difficult uh, questions, you know, online um, uh, terrorist content, uh, you yeah, know, of course. Uh, child pornography, uh, some very, very difficult issues. Of course, that was the prerogative of the, of the nation. But then you had um, issues where, where the European Union, in our case, uh, hold the responsibility. So you were sort of working the intersection between uh, national and and regional uh, policies or, or politics, mm -hmm. but 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 that that I think applies in a number of different areas, not only in um, in terms of of uh, technology and digitalization. Um, I think this is the experience of a number of ambassadors and diplomats: is that they go out into the field, they they really become experts in the field, they really understand what's going on, they link up with all of the different players that the country really should be looking at, and then they go back home and they say, "This is what I brought back to you." And then you find that you don't necessarily, you, you have another mindset that you need to deal with there. Would that have been the case? Who would you be reporting into? Um, would you be speaking to other, mini uh, other ministries within uh, the government? Was there, you know, any, how, how did you gain traction is, is what I'm asking. Listen, I think this is really a terrific question, and this is one of the areas where we were struggling a little bit, just to be very, uh, very frank with you, because, mm -hmm. You know, being the ambassador of, of a country, you by default represent all strands of, of government. You don't only work for the yeah. foreign ministry, you work as much for, for the Ministry of, of Finance or the Ministry of Energy, whatever it might be. Sure. Uh, but, but because we did something new, uh, we also spent a lot of time in building up networks back home, in my case, in, in Denmark, yeah. working with yeah. line ministries, trying to explain what is the added value for, you know, the Ministry of Digitalization, why do they need to use uh, you know, a tech ambassador for these kind of conversations? And, and I, I think the way we tried to do this, Omar, was, was showing by example that we could provide added value uh, to colleagues across the Danish government. And the way of doing that is, is you know, building up the network, uh, setting a clear set of priorities, uh, working with the industry um, on topics that are of, of national interest uh, to, mm -hmm. to in, in my case, to, to Denmark. So, so I think getting that right uh, was, was enormously important. But like any other ambassadors, you have to fight for, for a bit of airtime with, uh, with decision yeah. makers uh, back home. We were lucky or unlucky, depending on how you look at it, that the reality is sort of caught up uh, while we were in the middle of it. So you had you know, Cambridge Analytica came out in the middle of our, course, yeah. our tenure. Um, so, you know, I, I normally joke with, with saying that when I was uh, ambassador of Denmark to Indonesia, I never ever got a question, who are you, uh, what are you doing? And I, I got that question every single day when I was the ambassador to the, to the tech industry in Denmark. But those questions sort of died down a little bit when you had the Cambridge Analytica, when you had a number of, of data leaks coming forward, because I think people yeah. realized the power, the influence of the tech companies at a level where it's comparable to, to nation states and therefore you do need to have a dialogue and interaction and hold them all to account. Yeah, well, um, before we get on to nation states, um, there, there are many examples of major companies coming to the region and advising governments. Is there not a conflict of interest in giving that advice? I think, I think there, there can be a conflict of interest in, in giving that advice, but I think the different cultures and they also did a little bit of a different uh, approach depending on what governments you are talking to. Mm -hmm. Now, I, I come from a northern European country, as you know, and, and we've never um, shied away from bringing the private sector into discussions about uh, regulations, about policies. So I think, mm -hmm. I think for us, it's quite natural that this is a multi-stakeholder approach where we benefit from discussing you know, mm -hmm. difficult mm -hmm. topics to get it right. What I would say, uh, and I, you know, I, I have the same view even on this side of the table, is at the end of the mm. day, policy reigns supreme. And what I mean by that is, of course, government sets the direction, they create the regulatory framework, they create the, the policies that we have to align with. That's not for, for the private sector to, mm. uh, to define. What, what I would say is that I think what, what the private sector brings to the table is sort of a, a, a more fundamental understanding of what technology is able to do, what technologies are not able to do. And you know AI being a, a enormously good example, where I think there is a a, a steep learning curve for, for all of us. Yeah. Uh, I, I consider myself being part of that in, in better understanding what is it that we're talking about, how is that going to help us, how is how is it going to, to challenge us, and then and bringing that discussion into the uh, the government offices. Uh, I don't think it's about taking away power uh, from governments. It's about making sure that we have the right 
uh, level and information before we decide where to go. So if you can uh, take a look at a, a company like Uber, uh, which was particularly interesting at its height, um, because it seemed to bully its way into um, different economies. And I think one of the clearest examples of how it was pushed back was in, in London, where its license was taken away. Um, but it, its its strategy was to come in, uh, to provide a service, to hire a whole bunch of people, and to create a constituency, basically, of drivers and users uh, of the app. And then to pressure governments into to regulating and, and, and basically regularizing their uh, presence. How, how, does, uh, how, do you see, how do you view that approach as opposed to more kind of uh, benign approaches? Because for, for me, that dem demonstrated the power, especially the power of a Western uh, North American tech company um, entering markets. Now, I, I can't speak uh, in, in terms of the strategy in, in, in Uber. What, what I can say is I think the overall uh, approach of technologies, technology companies will have to be based on, on the local situation. And I think that's perhaps mm. uh, where a lot of companies have a lot of lessons learned. If, yeah. I, if I take my own job, um, being responsible for European government affairs now for Microsoft, um, I, I think there are, there are two ways of looking at what we do in Europe. Uh, one is mm -hmm. to try and seek to influence uh, the different policies or the different approaches according to what we think uh, is right from a technology point of view. The other mm -hmm. alternative is to say, well, you know, we have to align our activities with the, the vision, uh, the policies, the, the priorities of, in our case, European governments or the European mm -hmm. Commission. And it might, might seem like a small, tedious difference, but I think it's actually a fundamentally different approach. And where I want to help contribute with, with my team is to say, well, you know, we have now a, a European Commission who formulated a very clear set of priorities, uh, Europe fit for the digital age. I think it's about catching up to a world that is increasingly becoming bipolar with the US and China being the main players on technology. Yeah. Europe needs to, to catch up. We need to make sure that, that Europe will remain a player, creating jobs, growing the economy, you know, having a cutting edge uh, technology companies um, in, in, in Europe as well. How do we do that as a, as a Microsoft? Well, I think we have to you know, respect the, the direction that Europe wants to head. And then we have to find out how could we have our technologies fit into that overall vision? How can we sort of, the way I formulated this, take fit for Europe to make sure mm -hmm. it's, it's us aligning, it's us, us adjusting with, with what the Europe wants to do and where Europe wants to, to head. And one of the ways of doing that is to, to you know, have informed dialogues, better understand the local market before you roll out uh, some of these newer technologies. And I think that's one of the lessons learned we've seen in the last five years, to be honest with you, Omar, that it, it, it rarely, um, it rarely, uh, sort of ends up in a good place if you if you come in uh, basically want to to determine how your technologies is operating in local markets it's it's a two-way street and technology companies will have to have situational awareness and uh, and have respect for for the local customs the cultures and the overall approach of individual countries in this area and but how does that um, balance out against the profit motive because presumably um, public companies uh, their main function is to make as much profit as possible I'm assuming. I mean, you know, yeah. the idea of even a, a monopoly situation would not be uh, uh, unpleasant, I think, for Microsoft or any of yeah. those companies. Listen, I'll say something, and you probably you can rightly accuse me for having, uh, you know, drunk the Kool Aid afterwards and having gone native <laughs> already. But but you know, when when I took the decision to move from government to to the private sector, you know, it wasn't an easy decision. I've been working in government or the European Union, NATO for for almost two decades. So it was mm -hmm. a, a significant change for me. It, it was a less difficult change because of the company that I joined. Um, sure. And what, I'm, what I mean by that is that I think, you know, Microsoft, you might agree or disagree, but I think Microsoft for, for a very long time has always tried to be um, having sort of a responsible approach to technology where we take into account the fact that we have to, you know, uphold uh, privacy, we have to defend democracy, we have to make sure that our our technologies are not undermining, uh, you know, the, the, the societal structures or the international system. So, so I think my point here is that um, there are different approaches also among the big technology companies. Um, yeah. Having having a responsible approach to technology fundamentally is is in, incredibly important for me um, also as an individual. So that change mm -hmm. was easier because of the company that I joined. Interesting, because that, that brings to mind the, the, the question, were you offered other jobs with other companies that you uh, turned down or were not interested in because of, say, an ethical position that they took? 
Well, I, you know, I, I think I'll, I'll keep my answer to just saying that it was at least a very easy one for me to uh, to go to, to to into this job. I've been working with a lot of the companies. Um, yeah. but there, there are there are different philosophies and different approaches that would fit more with with how I see the role of the private sector and, and the role of the technology companies. And in yeah. that sense, it was it was a match made in heaven that I was able to join this particular company. Oh, that's fantastic! Wow. So, are you going to tell us about how Microsoft is uh, is working on on COVID and saving us? I think I think again that's sort of the question that is on everybody's mind, um, and we were talking a little bit offline about the situation in the UAE and in, in Europe, and you know I'm currently sheltering in in, uh, in the Bay Area in the US, um, and it goes without saying that you know this is an enormously difficult situation for for everybody, and um, you know we have to remind ourselves that some of us are, are privileged enough not to work in areas that are extremely hard hit by by the economic mm -hmm. recession. You know, I think in the U.S., I haven't seen the numbers of today, but we're talk, probably talking in the vicinity of 40 million people that lost their jobs in, in just a couple of months' time. Um, I think the numbers in Europe are slightly better, but who knows whether we've just seen the peak of, of, a, of a recession that will have a dramatic impact on, on individuals. So what I would say is that I think for all of us, whether we work in government or whether we work in the private sector, uh, the next couple of months or the next couple of years will be all about how we respond to COVID-19. Um, where we are right now is, of course, sort of mitigating uh, the height of the pandemic before we hopefully have a vaccination that will, will solve the problems more permanently. So what we've been doing in Microsoft is, is sort of in a, diff a couple of different areas, trying to support healthcare authorities as they respond mm -hmm. to the immediate consequences of COVID-19. And, and those are things like, you know, making sure that, that healthcare authorities can, can collaborate uh, working remotely, you know, on, on teams or or um, yeah. you know, communicating, sharing information. It's supporting, you know, research, uh, scientific research uh, that are that are heavily focused on, on finding a cure or a treatment for for the pandemic. But it's also in other areas. Uh, education, I think, is something that is is enormously important. Also, as we look at skilling, um, just as, a, as an example, in Greece, we we've helped. Uh, basic transition uh, almost all of the universities so they can do remote uh, education um, and, and let's face it Omar I don't know the situation in the UAE but this is probably not going to disappear within a couple of months I think we'll have to get used to reality where we work more remotely we educate more remotely and we also yep. have to to provide some basic uh, government functions uh, with with remote uh, technologies so, yep. so those are, are different ways that that we've been trying to go about it but we've done all of that with a lot of focus on on key values, uh, ensuring privacy, uh, making sure that our technologies uh, are, are still adhering to to the strong, strongest uh, ethical uh, principles. Um, and and again, you know, it will be all about finding ways of creating jobs, about regrowing the economy, and um, and and that's an area where I think we have to to look at our own technologies to make mm -hmm. sure that they fit uh, into into the economies that we are seeing develop after COVID nineteen. You know, one of the, the things that surprised me was the level of preparation that the Emirates um, uh, demonstrated when COVID appeared. Uh, and one of the, the key areas was in education. And it turned out that I think it, it was in uh, I believe it was six, seven, eight years ago uh, that the government actually developed a, an online system for education. And it was initially targeted at children who were either being treated in hospitals abroad or who were with family members abroad. And so that, that basic um, infrastructure was already there. And then as soon as COVID started, within a very, very short period, that was expanded to the entire uh, educational system. Uh, and in many ways, you know, in the early 2000s, there was the idea of Internet City. Um, you know, the, the government of Dubai was very keen on this new thing called the Internet. And, uh, you know, a lot of you know, naysayers, uh, I was one of them, were, was like, you know, these are gimmicks, this is not real, whatever. And it actually turned out that there was remarkably um, uh, forward thinking at a time when um, most people didn't really think that there would be much coming out of it. Um, and what I find absolutely fascinating is that out of a number of what looked like separate um, uh, online ventures turned out into, to, to be something called the backbone of our government. Yeah. And it's really, really remarkable. Immediately, everybody disappears into their homes and everybody's online, everybody's able to communicate. Um, absolutely fascinating. So, um, so I was just also, if I could sort of tie that into um, Bill Gates, Bill Gates, having spoken uh, a number of years ago and saying that a pandemic would be, you know, his his biggest fear, 
Um, how, do, how did that affect the way, say, Microsoft looked, to, looked at the world? I mean, it, in terms of pandemic, the idea of confinement would have been something that, that would have been obvious. So was, was that something that, that Microsoft already had an idea about and was prepared for? Or, or am I just sort of, you know, clutching at straws here? No, absolutely. Let me just actually touch upon one thing you said before, Mark, because I think that's incredibly important. Um, you know, I'll say something which is probably enormously inappropriate for me uh, working for, it, for, for, for Microsoft now. <laughs> but, you know, I've, I've historically been quite uh, skeptical on what you could do online, you know, online meetings, yeah. virtual meetings. I always found that it creates sort of a distance between people. You don't have the physical contact, you know, read a room. Um, yeah. I think today, having spent a lot of hours on uh, in virtual <laughs> meetings in the last couple of months. I think that barrier has been removed a little bit. I, I don't feel very far away from you having this conversation. I think yeah, we're connecting in, 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 a, in a quite good way. Do I miss uh, having physical meetings? You bet. Do I hope that we'll be able to return to physical meetings as well? Absolutely. But what yeah. I would say is that I think the last couple of months have, of course, accelerated digitalization. In, yep. in a way that you know, perhaps in two months we've seen you know two years of, of traditional digitalization but i think also importantly it has removed some of the barriers some of the skepticisms to working remotely you know meeting people online and i think that will have longer term consequences how we work how we relate to each other um but um, but but hopefully in a combination with us being able to connect in, in the physical world uh, as well so, so i think it's it's been helpful and fundamentally you know i'm a tech optimist i think that technology it will bring good things to the world. It will empower people. It will connect people. Um, of course, not being blind towards some of the challenges that technology will will also bring along. You know, come back to your point about uh, about Bill Gates and and his foresight in in what was going to happen. Yeah, you know, I'm I'm new to Microsoft, so I'm probably not the best one to answer that question. But for me, also sitting on 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 the senior leadership team in Microsoft, um, it's certainly evident that it runs very deep in the DNA that you know it's a company who wants to play a helpful role for societies yeah. in general and then when you have a global pandemic then you know it's, it's all docs and row and you've worked tirelessly on trying to find ways of mitigating the dramatic consequences mm -hmm. of, the, mm -hmm. of that crisis some of it is in healthcare other bits and pieces is you know again as we spoke about before making sure that our technologies will, will be helpful uh, other aspects is about looking a little bit more into the crystal ball avoiding that the dependency on 21st century uh, technology. And Omar, I, I don't know if you would agree with me, but I think, could you imagine handling the pandemic without having you know, 21st century technology? We would have been in mm -hmm. a very, very difficult spot. And I think even more people would have been in the horrible yeah. situation of losing their jobs, uh, their healthcare, their, their basic income. Uh, now that said, yeah, I think we also wanna make sure that that, that dependency will not be translated into, I think, what has been sort of called tech lash in, in Europe. You know, the yeah. concerns that we are too dependent on a few uh, big American companies uh, that are not always playing by, by the democratic rule book. I think we have to work together to sort of get that right. And, and again, pay a lot of attention to the concerns that are being expressed by citizens, by civil society organizations, by media, and ultimately by, by governments. But, mm -hmm. but the, the short answer is yes, I think it runs very deeply in the DNA of the company that I joined to try and yeah, be yeah. and take responsibility even uh, without people asking us to do that. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Well, uh, the next question I was gonna ask you actually relates to uh, how um, general populations should view tech companies like, uh, like Microsoft. And you know, you're presenting a wonderful you know, sort of gentle image, one that uh, of, of Microsoft really being a global citizen and wanting to make sure that it, it acts ethically. But what advice would you give well, maybe, maybe not, uh, maybe that's an unfair question, but wouldn't it also be fair for governments and populations to sit back and say, fine, I, I, I hear you, I can hear you, but I'm not gonna take that at face value. I need to test, I need to, to make sure that actually we are really on the same page. Uh, because again, yeah, there are shareholders, there are interests, there, there, there's financial, financial benefits. Um, no, so where, no. where, where does Microsoft as a company make sacrifices that we could actually see? and sort of identify an ethical position being taken as opposed to a profit profit decision. Yeah, well, first of all, you know, as I said, absolutely. I think you shouldn't take things for face value. You should, you should be able to develop your own views and your own um, your policies, your own regulatory framework for that. And I think one of the ways of doing that is to invest in better understanding uh, the tech yeah. industry and technology. Again, I, I just want to give credit uh, to, to what you've done in the UAE with, with the Minister for AI. Yeah. I think I was the first 
uh, Czech ambassador, but I think my good friend, uh, the minister for, for AI was the first minister globally for, for AI. And I think, you know, is that about um, uh, making nice to the tech industry? No, it is not. It's also about holding the tech industry to account in making sure that we test uh, the arguments of what, what the big technology companies are saying. And, and, yeah. and again, making sure that you have competence and you have um, you know, the appropriate level of information so you can take your own decisions. Has that, yeah. has that view changed because I've jumped to the other side of the table? Absolutely not. Um, no. and, and I think that's a fundamental sort of democratic aspect that you have to make sure that you hold actors to account I think it's yep. no different with the tech industry. If you take, you know, something which is important in the region you're sitting in, uh, you know, oil and gas, I think you have increasingly also seen uh, that sector come under scrutiny uh, from envi for envi environmental reasons, et cetera. Yeah. I think the same, same level of scrutiny will, will be applied on, on the technology side. And I, I think ultimately, and we're doing that already, once in a mm -hmm. while you will take decisions that are not only good for the bottom line, but are, that are good for societies. And, and mm -hmm. again, I think more, more and more companies will you know, ultimately have to choose between making an extra buck and doing what is right and appropriate for, for societies. Um, we've, if I take one area that, um, that uh, has gained a lot of attention, and it's certainly not over yet, facial recognition. Yeah. You know, that's certainly a technology where there are enormous opportunities. You know, in healthcare, you can use it to diagnose uh, diabetes. You can, you can use it for many, many wonderful things on healthcare. Can you use it for surveillance and control at the same time? Absolutely. Um, so, so I think this is an area where we as a company have said very clearly from the beginning, we would welcome regulations. We, we should not leave it in the hands of the tech mm. industry to define how that technology is rolled out. And you know, better have regulation coming forward from from responsible, progressive, democratic countries than leaving it own to to the tech industry. So, so I think those are examples where yeah. where we have to once in a while stop up and, and consider very carefully the role that we're playing with these new technologies. So, can I ask if, for example, no regulation was forthcoming on a particular uh, innovation? Um, at, at what stage do you think uh, Microsoft or other companies would just say, okay, well, we've just got to join the race. If there is no regulation, we will, we will um, either try to dominate the field or try to impose a stand ourselves. Is, is, is that the kind of um, situation that the companies find themselves in? You know, I, I think it goes back to the, to the question of, of scrutiny and accountability. So it, it might be sort of a slightly theoretical uh, question in the sense of what, what area could that be? But in general, you know, let's say that we do have technology areas that are unregulated, then yeah. I think we should demand as citizens, as governments, as civil society organizations, that, that those companies will act in a responsible way. Mm. And, and what that means in practice is perhaps to take a, a firmer uh, approach to some of these technologies, despite the fact that you're not utilizing uh, the full potential of those technologies from the outset. And, and I think, again, that, that goes back to the, the fact that we also have to make sure that we have a new generation of technology leaders, not only the big uh, companies in the U.S. or in China yeah. or the Middle East, but also, you know, the next generation of entrepreneurs and startups that are coming uh, up all over the world that we built into their DNA from the beginning, sort of data ethics or responsibility, so that once they are sitting mm -hmm. as the CEOs of the new companies, that that is a natural part of, uh, of decision making that is not only about making a ton of money, it's actually also, you know, developing <laughs> technologies or companies that will work for the benefit of societies. So, so is that happening already? Yeah, I think it is happening already that companies are taking decisions not to fully pursue opportunities because of considerations on whether this is, uh, is right or whether uh, the markets are mature enough to, uh, to, to encompass that. That's fascinating, the idea of, of uh, kind of ethical positions within um, development of technology. So um, if you take if you take the ethics around uh, AI uh, and the question of whether you know sort of a car would swerve out of the way of a of, of an old person or or, uh, or not. Um, so I, I once wondered why is it that no? How could we start talking about uh, ethical positions given that actually different parts of the world have very different analyses of uh, ethical situations? There's an individualist approach in certain places. There's a uh, uh, a, a more communal approach in other places. And where is that, that discussion uh, taking place about how all of this can come together? Or will we actually end up with um, systems of technology that are actually operating on different, different moral bases? Yeah, I, and I'm, I'm sure you can find examples where there might be cultural differences as, as, you, as you allude to, Omar. But, but you could probably also argue that in most areas, 
that would be sort of almost a global approach that would would benefit uh, those people. And what I'm thinking about here on AI is, I think the big question is is bias. You know, if you change if you if you train AI systems just during using, you know, unfortunately middle aged white men and you know. I'm on one guilty as charge. <laughs> yeah, yeah, well, <laughs> I, 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 I try to pretend that I'm still young and vibrant, but the, you know, the birth certificate says something else about that. But, but, but I, think, I think this is a real issue. Um, we have to make sure that our, our AI systems are inclusive, that it takes into account you know, different standpoints, that it, it, mm. it really is uh, that, that we train them so that they fit uh, everybody, that it's not just for a small uh, elite that will have the full benefits of AI. And, and again, I think that's, that's our, how, that very much has to do with how we build uh, our AI systems, how we build you know, the next generation of researchers. So it's a natural thing to say, you don't take a small segment of society, you, you mm. make sure that you have you know, a very big uh, data set uh, that, that uh, sort of increases the neutrality. Does that mean that we won't have you know, cases coming forward where the AI systems are perhaps not neutral or completely mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, unbiased? No, we'll probably have more of that. But I think that's a responsibility that lies in, in the industry. But I would also say that's a super good example of where, where governments will have to really, uh, you know, uh, go into the steep learning curve to better understand what's happening to make sure that you set the right, excuse me, the right framework for, for the development of AI. Again, as I said before, I don't think I'm a particularly naive person, and I see a lot of challenges coming forward with some of these new technologies. But fundamentally, I would be very, very sad if we have a number of, of scandals or crises that would generate skepticism among ordinary people in what these new technologies can do. And this is where I remain sort of optimistic that I, I think, you know, AI or or many of the other uh, platform opportunities that we bring forward will ultimately bring enormous opportunities for people, including people that are in the periphery of society, if we look mm. to Africa, Southeast Asia, Latin America, you know, I, I think we, we can provide better healthcare, better education, uh, better job opportunities if we use uh, the new technologies that are coming online. And I think COVID-19 has made that crystal clear to, to everybody. But yes, we need to focus much more on, on an ethical approach to, to technology um, across the board. And so um, how does a company like Microsoft deal with um, non-democratic countries? non-democratic states, but because a lot of what you said uh, gives this democratic ethos, uh, yep. and Microsoft regards itself as an American company, right? Um, so when interacting with non-democratic uh, governments, how does, how does that conversation take place? Well, I think that the beginning of that is, is a very clear set of values that, uh, that has been articulated quite strongly also by Microsoft saying, you know, we are pro-democracy, we're pro-human rights, we want to make sure that we, uh, that we, we do what is right for, for society. So, so does, mm -hmm. does that mean that, we're not, uh, that our technology is not available in, in non-democratic countries? No, that's not the case. And I think the, yeah. the transformational aspect of technology is something that, that we ultimately believe in. But I would also say that this is also about empowering uh, individuals, it's about empowering uh, societies, it's empowering you know, the business to make sure that our, our technologies are available um, to, to grow uh, you know, for a small startup company in the Middle East or in Southeast Asia, that you can, you can really make the most out of, of your opportunities. So, so I, think, I think there are different uh, approaches on this, but I do think that it is incredibly important that, uh, that companies, including Microsoft, are formulating sort of an overall set of ethical principles on what we mm -hmm. think is, uh, is going to be important and that will also steer our business and, and our overall approach to, to doing business mm -hmm. around the world. Here's a, here's a question that's making me smile. Uh, now that you're tech ambassador for uh, a, a major tech company, would you uh, open your door to a tech ambassador from another North, uh, uh, North European country? Or would you say, no, thank you very much. I'm already speaking to the policymakers. You know, the funny thing is, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm sort of tempted to give you a story from the real life of a uh, Danish one, tech yeah. ambassador. Because we, 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 we articulated very early in the process sort of a principle and that yeah. principle was based on the experience of, of diplomats all over the world. That when you go to another country, um, you hand over your credentials. 
in, mm. uh, in my case, it's sort of a letter from uh, Her Majesty the Queen of Denmark to the head mm. of state or government in, in the local place. And that's the first conversation you have. So you, yeah. you give that letter, you have a small uh, conversation, and after that, you are the representative of, uh, of the country mm -hmm. uh, in, in the country you're, you're operating in. And then you begin sort of trickle down and have uh, discussions with different uh, parts of society, different parts of government. So, so we, we, we very early on said, we're not going to sort of meet the, the general manager level. We're not going to meet the, everybody in the thing. So we want to go in at the highest level. We want to meet with executives. Yeah. And then after that initial conversation, we can meet with, with uh, let's say, uh, substantial experts in different parts of the organization. So, so, so the honest answer is I'm not sure I'm, I'm high enough to be asked to meet with, uh, <laughs> with diplomats or tech ambassadors for, for countries. Um, listen, bad joke, uh, but joking aside, absolutely. And, and I'm actually using or misusing, if you like, uh, COVID-19 to, um, to do quite a lot of conversations with uh, members yeah. of the European Parliament, with members of governments across Europe. Um, so, so in that sense, I think if I can be helpful in facilitating that dialogue now with, with my new role, also based on my own from time to time, um, traumatic yeah, yeah. experience of being, <laughs> being a Danish tech ambassador and not being able to get access to the executives. I, I think, I think, I think that's uh, that's a good thing. What I would argue, Omar, is that um, I think 2020 is very different from 2017 when I began my my previous mm. job. I think the understanding in the industry of the necessity of working together with governments is at a different place today, in a, in a, in a better place, a more mature place. So, mm. so hopefully, my 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 successors uh, yeah. will uh, will have uh, easier ways of, of dealing with the industry uh, together. And and then the only thing I would say at the end is. Uh, you know, ultimately, this is also about multilateralizing these efforts. It's about, you know, making sure that more and more countries will do the same. So if we look at what happened in the last couple of years, you know, uh, the UN uh, Secretary General set down this uh, high-level panel of digital cooperation. They came forward with a report um, sort of indicating why it is that we need to invest more in, in understanding technologies. The European mm -hmm. Union set down a tech panel. You know, last week I was discussing with, with NATO uh, how they approach uh, sort oh. of disruptive technologies. So, so I think I think there is momentum in building yeah. these multi-stakeholder approaches, um, and and I think it's high noon for that. We we all need to do that uh, before the the train leaves the station. And do you think that the, there's need for a new forum uh, to to kind of promote that idea, or do you think it'll fall into the traditional uh, places? It, it, that, that's a question that I've been thinking very hard about in the last couple of years, mm -hmm. and you know. I, you know this better than anybody that creating new forums or formats is is always uh, difficult um so, so i think i think i think the answer which is not very um uh, elegant is is twofold i think we have to make sure that in existing uh, structures uh, for forums mm -hmm. formats that the technology discussion becomes not sort of a, a a random once every two year discussion but it's something yeah. that goes across the board i think the un security council is a good example of that in the European Union. We have to be sure that technology is, is on the agenda, um, uh, you know, uh, right, left, mm -hmm. center on everything that we're going to do. Do, do, we, need, do we need new formats? Um, well, I, I think we've seen a couple of things coming online. Um, if, if we look at sort of cybersecurity, that I think is an incredibly important uh, part of, mm -hmm. uh, of, the, of the challenges that we're facing. Uh, I, I just want to say the Paris Peace Forum and the Paris Call, um, the Christchurch Call, I mean, all of that fits very well into a multi-stakeholder approach that we haven't seen before. Because of mm. course, Omar, you know that the UN Security Council resolution will remain a forum for, for governments and states to yeah, discuss. Sure. Um, I think what the Paris call and the Paris Peace Forum did was to say, well, in the 21st century, we actually have governments, but we also have the private sector in the same room, mm. You're coming forward with, with solutions in this case to, to terrorist attacks and, and, uh, and yeah, cyber attacks. Yeah. Um, so I think, I think we'll see more of that, but, but again, I would certainly uh, continue to argue that uh, you know we don't want the tech companies to have a permanent seat in the Security Council. Uh, that will never be, uh, be the appropriate uh, approach. But do we want the companies to be affiliated or associated with some of the, 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 the more global discussions? I think the answer is yes on that one. And I would have said the same also before joining Microsoft, just to you know, avoid any, any misunderstandings here. <laughs> yeah, so, you, so you've hinted that the idea of uh, tech companies actually attaining sovereignty uh, the idea of sitting at the at the UN 
Um, I think you know a lot of countries will, would actually say that sovereignty isn't what it uh, what, what you think it is, and perhaps uh, Microsoft could absorb a few territories and 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 run some countries. Uh, at what stage do you think you know uh, tech and the state will will kind of merge? Um, I know that in the Emirates we have a very very active government working in the tech field, trying to you know sort of jumpstart all kinds of innovation projects. Um, you know, in at least three of the Emirates, the key Emirates. And yeah, there's a tremendous amount of money and connectivity being brought to the, to the table. Uh, and there are also massive inv investments globally uh, taking place. If you look at countries like Russia and China, where there is an incredibly close relationship between the tech industry and government, although it's very um, kind of opaque, we don't actually know what kind of relationships are, uh, are there. Uh, how, do you, how do you foresee um, perhaps, you know, sort of non-democratic countries or let's say less democratic countries than, you know, sort of Western European ones? I mean, we, we, we are a consensus-based uh, uh, state. Uh, and so there's, there's a tremendous amount of sort of love and passion and traditional kind of types of loyalty. So we're all in the same boat. We're all on the same page. Um, how, do you, how do you see that relationship between um, tech and state coming together, if at all? I don't think we I don't think we see it as coming together. And I think you know the question of sovereignty is not something that you know on a personal basis that I think belongs to the industry uh, at all. I, I think we would continue to argue and actually defend the role of governments, that defend the role of international organizations. And what I would say is that I think in in, in sort of the world that we're living in right now, uh, also with the pandemic, uh, you know, having more voices defending you know an international rules-based uh, architecture. Mm. Where, where, where organizations, international organizations, will, will play an important role, uh, will will certainly remain uh, one of the vocal voices in, in that area. I think what what you are what you're indicating is, is of course that that some of these new technology companies and their technologies can be heavily influential in you know the design of how societies are are working. You know, fully utilizing, uh, you know. Automation, I think, is a super good example of where, mm. where technologies are, are you know, providing opportunities, but also challenging uh, a couple of, uh, of countries around the world. I, I used to serve in, um, in in the fantastic country of Indonesia. I still miss it. Yeah. Um, you know, that's a country that had a very clear strategy of trying to take over some of the uh, production uh, labor that uh, became increasingly expensive in China because of the rise mm. of, in labor cost. At the same time, the government formulated the, that approach, and I'm being a little bit black and white on this one, uh, in comes automation. And if you look at, for example, the autom automotive industry, you know, in Indonesia, a lot of those traditional jobs were taken over by, by robots, uh, literally. So I think, I think we have to acknowledge that these new technologies are fantastic in creating opportunities, but in some places, mm -hmm. it will also create, uh, create challenges. Ultimately, um, I think the dialogue and the fact that we can work together, respectful of the fact that governments have the ultimate say in, in this is, is the right way forward. If we can be helpful and contribute with better awareness of the opportunities of AI or machine learning or you know, working remotely on, on teams, fantastic. But the boundaries will have to be set by, uh, by, by countries and international organizations. Okay, so, you, so Microsoft is a traditionalist when it comes to uh, global architecture. You can say that we're traditionalists, but, but I think we also are realists in the sense that we understand that some of the technologies that we're developing are mm. challenging the traditional structures uh, of, yeah. the, of, of the West, Westphalian mm. state, if you like. Yeah. Um, but, but, but I think that's not the same as saying that we want a completely different uh, architecture and that, that we mm. don't understand uh, the importance mm. of the role of, of governments. It will never be up to the industry to set you know, rules and regulations or, or policies that will continue to be the role of democratically elected uh, officials or, or government officials in this case. But tech overall has um, a different, different approaches also. I, I, there's at least one major tech company that uh, has famously taken over a certain area of a North American city uh, and is really designing it according to its own sort of ideal standards in terms of data collection and, and management. And you know that that actually sounds very tempting uh, from to, to a certain extent. So uh, uh, you know, in, in the way that we are um, um, given free uh, apps online in exchange for the information that we give them, uh, can you imagine a situation where an entire country would say, "Listen, come along, manage us, milk us for whatever you know revenues you need, but sort of maintain a certain standard uh, of you know social living?" Uh, just uh, 
thinking outside the box, could you ever en envisage something like that? Because I, I have heard at least one major hedge fund manager trying to convince a country to hand over a province for him to, for, to him for 10 years so that he could manage it. Um, and, you know, these are sort of out of the box fantasies. Uh, but could you could you ever imagine something like that? Maybe not from Microsoft, but for another company? I think, you know, having having spent quite a lot of time in, in Silicon Valley, I probably met a couple of venture capitalists <laughs> that would have a similar <laughs> approach to how to, to run the world. You know, Omar, I, I, I don't see that. Um, and in yeah. fact, I, I would just say that, you know, I'm, I'm relatively new to, to sort of the tech uh, world. I've just worked in it for the last four years. But I think yeah. even in those four years, um, I think it has developed into a more mature discussion. And I would mm -hmm. say that I think it's matured both on the government side, on the on the public side, but also on the on the private side. So I think mm -hmm. it would be difficult to find representatives that would argue that it's a fantastic idea for a private company to take over your basic functions of of, of governments or, or states yeah. in, in terms although, of the, although it has happened historically. Well, I think you've seen you've seen you've seen certain you've seen certain examples uh, on it. Mm -hmm. What I would say is that uh, you know, I'll, I'll avoid uh, naming names here, but I think yeah. just in the last couple of weeks, we've, we've also seen some of the other big technology coming, companies coming forward you know, in Europe to say, we would actu actually welcome the European Union uh, being firm on, on regulations, being firm on yeah. creating policies that we need to adhere to. And, yeah. and you know, that has raised criticism saying, you know, you, you're very late to the party. A lot of other companies have been saying this for years, but yeah. I don't think actually that's the most important thing to, to say. I think acknowledging that there is a mind shift uh, mind, sh uh, mind shift uh, taking place also on, on the um, among executives and, and the big technology companies acknowledging that you know life is difficult when you develop new technologies including technologies mm. that are incredibly influential over you and me and and mm. our, our fellow yeah. citizens and and actually the best way of making sure that we have a level playing field is for governments to create the right frameworks around that in some places, that's going to be super difficult and hard because of the complexities of new technologies. But yeah. for the general approach and saying, well, we would actually welcome, again, just using the example of facial recognition, we would welcome regulation in this area so we know how to develop our, uh, our technologies and how to make sure that our engineers are uh, navigating in the right way. Um, mm -hmm. and, and then, you know, if we take facial recognition, actually the state of Washington um, actually came forward with, I think, the the world's first regulation around uh, facial recognition, and we we welcome that. We think it's helpful that the the guardrails are being defined by by governments and, and decision makers. So, uh, you know, we have actually about twenty questions. Each question is incredibly long, and I'm not sure if you can actually see them. <laughs> I can't. <laughs> you can't. Oh, gosh, I should email them to you. Uh, so I really appreciate the questions. We, we, we can do some of them on uh, on social media afterwards, Omar. We can yeah, take a couple right, of them okay, if you want. Cool. Yeah. Yeah. I think I think that would be great, and, and that's fair. So you know, I, we know what states exist for. Uh, they they define a territory. They manage a population. They respond to the needs um, of of that that population. Uh, perhaps that's governments within states. But uh, what is tech's end game? Where where, do, where does technology want to go? And a part of that is who actually controls technology? So I think we were, we were talking about this a little earlier before the session started. Does technology have a life of its own and therefore it must expand in a certain way? Or do technology executives actually control the direction uh, that technology takes? I think the last thing first, yes, I think executives do control the, 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 the role of technology and where it's heading. But I, I think it's also fair to say that there is certainly the risk of technology getting its own life and just running away because of the opportunities that, you know, massive computational capacity delivers. Yeah. Cloud computing is, is a game changer in so many ways because it's basically the enabler of, uh, of AI or machine learning um, uh, in, in a more fundamental way. But, but, but I, I think that, that goes back to the responsibility, which uh, I'm repeating myself like an old broken... Uh, record here I, I think it is fundamentally important that you as a government official civil yeah. society organization media individual citizens are increasingly holding you know the industry to account raising the the, the need for 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 executives to, to act in a responsible way i think um, i'm speaking here in, in my in my personal capacity i think there is going to be a price to pay on the other side of covid 19 where there mm. will be a lot of scrutiny around who did well uh, during COVID-19, who, mm. who worked in support of, um, of government struggling with this incredible 
pandemic and, and the massive consequences. So, so I think you know we'll see commissions being stood up in in different countries assessing you know really? what happened. Did we did we uh, did we respond in, in the right way? So, mm -hmm. so I think that's a helpful reminder to all of us that are working uh, on mm -hmm. on the industry side to make sure that we do what is right, that we're helpful, that we understand that you know when when governments are struggling with an unprecedented challenge, that we mm -hmm. do everything we can to try and make our technology useful. You know, simple things like bots for the healthcare system, reducing the workload on on healthcare workers that sure. are overstretched. It might seem like a small thing, but if you can you know take away ten percent of the um, of the working responsibility for a doctor or nurse that are working on COVID-19 patients, mm -hmm. that's a very significant release of, uh, of, of horsepower uh, to do what is good for patients that are in, in difficult needs. So, so I think there are many, many examples on how our technology will be helpful in times of crisis, but fundamentally it's also about making sure that as we look into the next five, 10 years, the next couple of decades, that you know the power of technology, and again, I'm optimistic about it, yeah. but that really works to the benefit of, of everybody in an inclusive way, uh, to the benefit of societies uh, in, in general. So perhaps I should have asked this earlier. Um, has, has Microsoft actually rejigged itself, redirected itself, um, or at least part of, of itself to uh, tackling COVID? I mean, are there specific, yeah. are there teams working on, on the issues around? I think it's going to be very, very difficult to find a Microsoft employee who is not heavily engaged on COVID-19 in really? many different oh, ways, in many right. different yeah. ways. But, uh -huh. but it's also, I mean, again, it's about, I think, listening very carefully to what, where we need to, to help governments or societies or healthcare workers mm -hmm. in, in this situation. And sometimes it's small, easy things like providing, you know, teams so that people can communicate, they don't have to be yeah. facing in the same room. Other times it might be bots. It's about you know helping uh, research, scientific research in terms of finding a vaccine. So, mm -hmm. so I think that's the power of technology that it can be sure. utilized in so many different parts. And I, I just want to say what I said earlier, on, Omar. I think it's incredibly difficult to see how we would have handled you know the, the current uh, global pandemic without having access to these uh, new technologies. Um, yeah, and if course. we act in a responsible way. Um, you know, I'm optimistic that actually this will help the digitalization efforts of our societies, which mm -hmm. ultimately I think will benefit uh, everybody if we do it the right way. Wow, oh, wow, oh. fantastic. So, Casper, uh, do you have any questions for me? Because we've come to the end of our hour. Now, just when we can meet in person in, in Dubai or Abu Dhabi, I'm looking forward to, to getting back. I, I, was, um, I visited, uh, I think, a year ago with, uh, in connection with the World Government Summit, and yes. I should have said this earlier on, but I think that was a super good example of, you know, in this case, the UAE taking the lead in convening a multi-stakeholder discussion, and technology was very heavily on the agenda. Um, I don't know what will happen to, to this year's World Government Summit, but I know from from other people yeah. that technology would again be uh, an impo important factor on it. So I would love to, 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 to stay in touch and, uh, and we continue to connect with you around these issues. No, thank you very much. Um, I'm, I'm on the World Government Summit, I'm pretty sure that they will sort something out. I know that um, the government officials in charge of, uh, of it are um, you know, keen, keen to continue these discussions and this will just be another chance to demonstrate what the Emirates can, can do. Casper, um, thank you so much for your time. And uh, I know that the Emirates is not part of the European Union, so we're outside of your remit. So again, thank you uh, very much for your generosity uh, and for clarifying so many pleasure. different things for us. Thank you so much. It's been a pleasure. Thanks a lot. And thanks for listening. Bye-bye. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Bye-bye.